Let's open our Bibles this afternoon, second hour, to Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. There's a fairly popular saying, at least there was at one time, actually derived from an old Irish poem that said, The best laid schemes of mice and men gang after glay, which is Irish uh, translation. The best laid plans of mice and men are often doomed to fail. Solomon said it this way, <clears throat> Proverbs 16, verse 9, he said, A man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directeth his steps. And I say that to explain that after telling you all Thursday night, I'll be wrapping up our study today on the Eastern Orthodox Church. I decided to put off that study until next week so I can bring today's message instead that the Lord, I believe, uh, led me to preach instead. The great theme of the book of Hebrews is the superiority of Christ's new covenant to the old covenant and to the law of Moses. In chapter 7, the writer is dealing specifically with the superiority of Christ's ongoing ministry as our faithful high priest and his eternal priesthood to the temporary, temporal, earthly, blemished, and greatly inferior priesthood of the Levites under the law of Moses. We read in Hebrews chapter 7, beginning in verse 21. For those priests, meaning those Old Testament priests, were made without an oath, but this, Jesus that is, with an oath, by him that said unto him, by the Father that said unto Jesus, The Lord swear and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. By so much... By this oath was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. And they, Old Testament priests, truly were many priests because they were not suffered, they were not allowed to continue by reason of death. They couldn't continue operating in the office because they all had to die. But this man, Jesus, because he continueth ever and forever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Verse 25, Wherefore, because of that, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. I want to talk today about salvation to the uttermost. Salvation to the uttermost. We read in verse 26, Paul continues, For such an high priest became us, in other words, in a more vernacular way of using that word became, such an high priest was becoming to us. I mean, he was, a, he was appropriate, he was fitting for us, he was just what we needed. That's what that means. Such an high priest became us, he was just what we needed, he was fitting for us. He was holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's. And this he did once, one time, when he offered up himself. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity, imperfect men, under the law of Moses. But the word of the oath, which was since the law, maketh the Son, who is consecrated forevermore. As for verse 27 here, it says that the Lord Jesus, as our high priest, needeth not daily, as those high priests offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. I want to point out today that that verse also has direct application to the false priesthoods of the Roman and Eastern Orthodox Catholic churches. Those false priesthoods, which were introduced actually very early in the 2nd century AD into the New Testament churches by the Nicolaitans and the Judaizers as an adaptation of the Old Testament priesthood. As they elevated or they hybridized the New Testament office of elder or overseer into the very non-scriptural office of a priest who stands between God and men to administer or even to ration God's grace to the people. To ration God's grace to the laity, they call them, the laity, that lower class of Christian that the Nicolaitans wanted to rule over. That word Nicolaitans means people rulers. They rule over the people, the laity, Nicolaitans. By the way, I have met some Nicolaitan Baptist pastors who seem to think that they were prophet, priest, and king to their churches, to their Baptist churches as well. Have we not, Mary? That said, though, I'm back to this text. At least the Old Testament priests Paul speaks of here, at least they were established, they were appointed, and they were authorized by God's law to exercise their priesthood. 
Not so with the counterfeit pagan priesthoods of the Catholic churches. Those false priesthoods have no, they have zero authorization, mandate, or any hint of any form of support in the New Testament scriptures. None. And much the contrary. According to this wonderful book of Hebrews, that very notion that those counterfeit churches would raise up a priesthood, contrary to this section of scripture right here, to blasphemously offer Christ's body and blood over and over every time they administer their blasphemous Eucharist, I believe is, an, is indeed as antichrist, as blasphemous, as Christ-denying and Christ-denigrating of any other pagan ritual that exists on planet Earth. It's an outright blatant denial of the crucial truth taught in this verse, that Christ's one-time sacrifice was all that was needed to save them to the uttermost, to atone for and to pay the full penalty for every past, present, and future sin committed by every Christian believer in every generation that would receive the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. One-time sacrifice paid it all. Jesus paid it all. That's why we also read over in chapter 9. In the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 9 verse 12 says, By his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. And as we read also in chapter 10 of Hebrews, in verse 11 to 14, that this man, Jesus, after he had, quote, offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down, because his work was done, on the right hand of God. And it says, For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified by one offering. And yet these Catholic churches presume to offer him over and over and over every time that Mass is said. It's an abomination. These verses say one-time sacrifice. That's all that was needed. And that one-time sacrifice of Christ on the cross is also all that ever would or that ever will be accepted by God the Father. The blasphemous Catholic Mass and Eucharist notwithstanding and deemed an utter abomination. Back to chapter 8 and verse 1. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. I'm going to focus in today on verse 25 of chapter 7, where we read, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost, that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. This verse begins with the word wherefore, which uh, means because of what he just said in verse 24 and preceding, because Jesus is not subject to death and infirmity because he is eternal, because he continues forever, and because his priesthood is unchangeable, therefore he is able also to save all them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. Amen. Seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. He not only made atonement for their sin, but he also continues to live as their high priest, making intercession for them. Salvation to the uttermost. What does it mean to say that Christ is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him? It means a couple of things. Because we're talking here about eternal salvation eternal redemption, infinite grace, and infinite atonement sufficient to cover the totality of the sins of all mankind in every age. As John says, this is an atonement that provides propitiation or satisfaction, not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world, John says. That word uttermost, as used here, is therefore actually a somewhat infinite word. Here's what John Gill says, of verse 25 in his commentary. This salvation to the uttermost is to be understood not of a temporal salvation, not of earthly salvation, deliverance from evil, deliverance from warfare, whatever, nor of providential favors and providing for us, etc., but of spiritual and eternal salvation and includes a deliverance from all evil here and hereafter. Of that phrase, he is able. Gill says this, this work required ability here was a law to be fulfilled, justice to be satisfied, sin to be bore, removed and atoned for, 
many enemies to engage with, and a cursed death to undergo. It was a work that no creature, angel, or men were able to undertake and perform. The priest under the law could not. Men cannot save themselves, nor can any creature work out salvation for them. But Christ is able, as appears from the help his Father laid on him, who knew him to be mighty, from his own undertaking it, being mighty to save, and from his having completely effected it. Gil says that word uttermost means to utmost perfection. To utmost perfection. So as nothing can be wanting in the salvation he is the author of, nor anything added to it, or forever to the utmost of time, even to eternity, as well as to the utmost of men's wants. Paul is saying here that Christ's high priestly ministry, which began with the sacrifice he offered of himself on the cross, and continues in his eternal and ongoing ministry of intercession for us, even now, ensures that for all that come unto God by him for salvation, he is able, he will save them, and he will bring them to that place of ultimate end and conclusion of their salvation. Amen. For which he suffered on the cross. For them to be eternally united with him in his glorious eternal kingdom of heaven. As Paul said in Philippians 1 verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of, Christ, of Jesus Christ. He began that work of salvation and he's going to keep performing that. He's going to make sure to keep us safe. That's why Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1 that we're saved by the power of God, kept by the power of God. So that's a partial definition of that word uttermost. But salvation to the uttermost refers not only to the end result of salvation for every believer as a promise to bring each believer to the uttermost of perfection and completion, to the uttermost end and the final destiny and chief end of our salvation, but it also means... Salvation to the uttermost of sinners. Salvation to the uttermost of sinners. Salvation to all who come to God by Him. Whosoever, without limitation, from whatever station in life and from whatever past life of the most wretched of sins, He's able to save them to the uttermost of chief sinners. He's able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by Him. That includes salvation even to those who after living horrible lives of sin and who may have rejected him in the past, finally come to him even in the hour of their death. Is deathbed conversion possible? Deathbed conversion is certainly not advisable. But salvation is available to all who come to God by him. Turn to Luke chapter 23. Luke 23. As proof of the fact that salvation is available to all even on the deathbed, I want to look in this chapter today at an account of a man who got saved just a few short moments before he died. As a vivid example of how the Lord Jesus can save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, even the worst of sinners. Luke 23, we read in verse 33, When they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots, and the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. If he be Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew, this is the king of the Jews. And then from verses 39 through 43, we read more about the two malefactors, the one on each side of the Lord. Verse 39, And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man had done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today 
shalt thou be with me in paradise. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth, until the ninth hour, and the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And he said thus, he gave up the ghost. We see here two malefactors, meaning scoundrels or criminals, who are being executed alongside our Lord, men who Matthew and Mark both describe as thieves. Uh, they may have been partners in crime, in the commission of some crime perhaps, uh, perhaps very similar to the very crime the Lord described in chapter 10 of Luke's gospel, where Jesus said in Luke 10 verse 30, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves was stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. They may have been like those criminals there. These are two reprobate criminals, two men of very similar background and circumstance, but men in whom we see two very different reactions, both to the state that they're now in and also to this person of Jesus, who has both literally and spiritually separated these two thieves by the interposition of his cross. Of the first, we read here in verse 39. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. That phrase, railed on him, in verse 39, is translated from the Greek word blasphemeo, which is, of course, where we get our word uh, blasphemy. He blasphemed him. It means to vilify, specifically to speak impiously, Occurs 35 times in the King James Bible, translated blaspheme, blasphemer, blasphemously, defame, railed on, reviled, speak evil. That's what it means to blaspheme. This was not a plea for true salvation. Save thyself and us. This was not a plea for true salvation. This was a statement of unbelief and scorn. As if to say, you can't be the Messiah because if you were, you'd save yourself and us. That's what he's saying, basically. This man had a hardened heart right up to the very bitter end. Though this man is hanging here in pain and agony, struggling for every breath of air, knowing he's about to die, none of that softened his hard heart or humbled his proud, arrogant spirit. It is a mystery to me why so many people we meet are just like this guy. Hard-hearted, unwilling, unable to come to repentance or to even hear the gospel. One of the guys I tried to witness to at the park said, don't try to church me. Don't try to church. I'm not, this is not about church, sir. This is about your eternal salvation. Hard-hearted. Many people are like that today. Proverbs 27, verse 22 speaks to people like that. It says, though thou shouldst bray a fool in mortar among wheat with a pestle, yet will not his foolishness depart from him. That's a very interesting illustration there. To bray wheat is to grind it into flour. Uh, to separate the husk from the wheat with a pestle and mortar is much more delicate and careful operation than the much simpler method of threshing. And so this proverb says the most elaborate efforts at correction are wasted on the incorrigible fool. Matthew Henry says here an obstinate, self-willed, stubborn man, cannot be reformed by any means. His folly has become second nature, is not to be eliminated by any teaching, discipline, or severity. Sad that people let themselves get in that type of a position. They may at one time in their life have been open to the gospel. They may have at one time felt like receiving Christ as their Savior. Maybe something happened, they got mad at God, and they turned from Him. They rejected the light, and what happened? God sent them darkness. And now they're in a place where they can't even receive the light. It's a very sad state of affairs. Mm -hmm. It's dangerous and it's, it's terrifying to think that men can get like that. Sometimes that kind of blindness, as I said, is a judgment from God. When such fools are given over to a reprobate mind, as Paul says in Romans chapter 1, as we also see in Proverbs 29 verse 1 where it says, He that being often reproved, hardeneth his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed. And that without remedy. That is the end result of the stubborn man who hardens his neck against the truth, 
The Bible says he will be suddenly destroyed and that without remedy. We see many examples of this in the Bible. Pharaoh's refusal to let the Israelites go after seeing nine grievous plagues fall on the land of Egypt is one example. Again, in Jeremiah's day, foreseeing Israel's pending and looming destruction, Jeremiah lamented in chapter 5, verse 3, Jeremiah. He said, O Lord, are not thine eyes upon the truth? Thou hast stricken them, but they have not grieved. Thou hast consumed them, but they have refused to receive correction. They have made their faces harder than a rock. They have refused to return. So what happened? God wiped them out, destroyed them. The hard-heartedness and stiff-neckedness of people who refuse the gospel. We read also of days yet to come in Revelation chapter 16, where it says that, And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seed of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented none of their deeds. Stiff-necked, hard-hearted. So for the first thief hanging there beside the Lord Jesus in pain and agony, knowing he's about to die, none of that softened his hard heart or brought him to any repentance. Instead, he railed on Jesus, blasphemed him, ridiculed him, repeating the same insults as those others in the previous verses who came to the the site just to mock and to scorn. The first thief railed on Jesus, never came to repentance or salvation. And then on the other hand, we have thief number two. I need to point out that we do know from Matthew and Mark's Gospels that at first, both of these men reviled Jesus. They reviled Jesus at first. But then something happened that brought one of these two thieves to his senses, to the realization that all eternity stood before him. And that brought him, finally, to true repentance. Perhaps it began when he heard Jesus appoint John to take care of his mother, Mary as his own mother, or for Mary to receive John as her own son. Maybe that reminded him of his mother and the warnings that she'd given him that went unheeded, that he now wish he listened to. Maybe it was when the sun went dark and the man fell under the conviction of the Holy Ghost It brought a realization of the terror of the Lord to his heart. Maybe it was when he heard tell this man Jesus before they had both come to the same condemnation, how he had healed multitudes and proclaimed the kingdom of God is at hand. And that he said he had come to give his life a ransom for many. It may have been when Jesus said, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. Maybe that's what softened his heart, I don't know. What we do know is that as an act of God's divine grace, this man received a revelation from God that brought him to repentance and saving faith in the Lord Jesus. We know from several things he said here, and also from what the Lord Jesus said in response. From what this man said, We know he came to believe on the Lord Jesus, to believe unto salvation. We know that. Many fools today say all roads lead to heaven. doesn't matter what you believe, as long as you live right and don't hurt anyone, everything will be fine. In fact, one guy said that to me yesterday. One of the Catholics said that to me. The Word of God says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And what a man believes determines how he is going to live, and right belief produces right living. And the Bible says what you believe determines where you'll spend eternity. What you believe determines where you'll spend eternity. And so from the second thief here, as the hour of his death approached, we know from several things he said here, he did come to saving faith. Faith in the person of the Lord Jesus, an acknowledgement that he is able to save to the uttermost and to come to God by him. We know that the second thief came to saving faith because the Lord Jesus responded Verily I say unto thee, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Those words tell us without doubt that this man did come to saving faith. And by the way, when he said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise, that doesn't mean they'd be in purgatory, by the way. It doesn't mean that after his death, Christ ascended into hell, as the alleged Apostles' Creed says, which by the way, never was the Apostles' Creed. It was always instead the Apostates' Creed, the heretical creed of the Roman Catholic Church that to this day preaches the pagan Babylonian heresy of purgatory. Jesus said, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. That means in the very presence of God. Absent from the body and present with the Lord. I'll come back to that point. 
So what did this man believe? What are the elements of this man's faith that brought him to salvation? Verse 39, And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. Verse 40, though, The other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? First thing we know he believed, he believed he was accountable to a sovereign God. Don't you fear God? This man believed in the sovereignty of God and the God who is to be feared. He is to be feared because he reigns supreme in the universe that he created and for which he writes all the laws, whose laws supersede every law devised and codified by man and whose laws transcend time itself, carry over into eternity. Don't you fear God, he said. And this man believed in a sovereign God to whom he knew he must give an account. And that very soon, since he's knocking at death's door right, right now. And it was the fear of God here that caused this man to stand up for Christ when all others, including his disciples, had left and turned away. And they stood afar off watching these things taking place. Thus not thou fear God. The Bible does say that the fear of the Lord is, is the beginning of wisdom. The recognition that there is a sovereign God that reigns in heaven and on earth to whom we will give an account for our actions, that has to precede any attaining of true wisdom. Fear of God. A man cannot even begin to have true wisdom until he comes to fear the sovereignty of God. And any man that doesn't fear God is a fool. But as Paul says of the condition of fallen men in Romans chapter 3, as is written, there is none righteous, there is no not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. There is none that doeth good, no not one. Paul says their throat is an open sepulcher with their tongues they have used to seat. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they have not known. Why? Verse 18, there is no fear of God before their eyes. That's why they do all these things. They don't fear God. Personally, I am very glad that the Holy Ghost put the fear of God in me and gave me a revelation of the terror of the Lord that brought me to salvation. That's what brought me to salvation. The revelation, an acknowledgement, a realization of the terror of the Lord through the conviction of the Holy Ghost. And I'm glad that we serve a sovereign God who reigns supreme in this world. Amen. Dost thou not fear God, he said? If you don't, you certainly should. Right belief produces right living. Second thing we know this repentant criminal believed. Number two, he believed that he deserved to be condemned. He knew he was a sinner. Dost not thou fear God, seeing that thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. This man had come to a point of repentance and acknowledgement of his sin guilt. Had he not done so, uh, by the way, he could not have been saved because he never have asked the Lord Jesus for mercy. As I've said before in several messages, you cannot separate repentance from sin from saving faith. Repentance from sin is a necessary element, inseparable element of saving faith. Some tell us, don't say repent, just say believe. The anti-repentance crowd. But repentance is a necessary element of believing on Jesus. Repentance is a change of mind about one's sin. When that word repent is used in the Bible, in the context of biblical salvation, it's referring to a God-given, spirit-led change of heart and mind toward God about sin. It's an acknowledgement of your own sin, guilt, and, and condemnation before God produced by the conviction of the Holy Ghost. And until a person becomes personally and exceedingly sinful in his own eyes, he will never see his need to repent or seek salvation. Right. Repentance is not a work. It's simply a recognition of one's wretched sinfulness before God. And this man, facing the hour of his death, knew he had been rightly condemned. The third thing we know about this man, number three, he believed the Lord Jesus was sinless. He believed the Lord Jesus was sinless. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation, and we indeed justly? For we receive the due reward of our deeds. 
But this man had done nothing amiss. This repentant thief could have had the attitude that, well, I don't know what he has done, but nobody's perfect. And I'm sure this man did something to deserve such a horrible punishment as this. Look at him. They beat him to a pulp. They put a crown of thorns on his head. He didn't do that to me. He must have done something really bad to deserve this. It would have been very natural for the man to have that reaction, to draw that conclusion. How often do we make those kind of judgments based on what we see about people? Mm -hmm. Wrong judgments. But that was not his conclusion. That statement that Jesus had done nothing amiss, I believe, is a revelation of the Holy Spirit to this man. Somehow he knew the Lord Jesus was sinless, that he did not deserve the punishment he was receiving. This may have included the revelation of Christ's divinity, which may also be why he asked the question, Dost not thou fear God? He perhaps knew that this man was the Son of God. Don't you fear God? You're going to talk to him that way? And this may also be indicated from the fourth thing we know, this this repentant criminal believed. Number four, he believed that the Lord Jesus himself was the sovereign over his kingdom. He said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. He knew it was Jesus' kingdom and that Jesus had power to make a decision up there. First, we see that this criminal called Jesus Lord. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3, Wherefore I give you to understand that no man can say Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. First, he called Jesus Lord. And then he shows that he believed Jesus is, in fact, the sovereign Lord. He said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. He believed that the kingdom of heaven belonged to Jesus. That's crucial. He believed that the Lord Jesus had power and authority in his kingdom to remember him and to make a decree concerning his fate. How he knew that, we don't know. We aren't given that detail. Maybe Jesus preached the gospel to him. I mean, you know, all the details aren't given here. So we don't know. But the text does indicate that he may well have heard Jesus preaching and teaching on the kingdom of heaven. It may well be true. Fifth thing we know, this repentant criminal believed. Though he knew he was a sinner, nonetheless, he believed the Lord Jesus could save him and bring him into his eternal kingdom. This is their very reason. He said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. This man believed he expressed in this simple plea for mercy, as Paul wrote in Hebrews chapter 7, that the Lord Jesus is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. Along with that point, I think we can also conclude from what this man said, it's quite possible that he understood the atonement of Christ for his sin. The man knew he was a condemned sinner, justly condemned, deserving condemnation he received, but he also knew the Lord Jesus was not guilty and he had done nothing amiss. He knew Jesus was sovereign over his kingdom and could save him and bring him into that kingdom. But look again in verse 40. The other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? You're in the same condemnation. In other words, here you are reviling this man who has done nothing amiss, but is here suffering the same condemnation that you are, not for anything that he has done. Perhaps it's true this man had heard of this Jesus, whose very name means the Savior, who said to those who thronged about him that he had come from his heavenly Father not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Maybe he'd heard him preach that. What we do know is based on the faith this man did show, he believed on him, he believed on Jesus, and we know here that this man had saving faith, faith enough to say no more than, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And therefore, on that basis alone, Lord Jesus said, Verily, I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Many things we glean from this story. One of the most important truths to glean and to remember, however, is that even a criminal at the hour of his death, who just hours before was reviling the Lord Jesus with the other thief, can come to repentance and be saved. Salvation to the uttermost. Includes not only the end result of salvation for every believer, but also includes salvation to the uttermost of of all sinners. Salvation to all who come to God by Him. Whosoever, without limitation, from whatever station in life and from whatever past life of the most wretched of sins, Jesus can save them to the uttermost, even to a worst-case scenario, all that come to God by Him. 
Jesus said, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. By the way, as stated, that word paradise does not mean purgatory. It does not mean hell as the Catholics have corrupted it, perverted it to mean by their blasphemous doctrines. It also does not mean any underground, cavernous, underworld prison that the Lord Jesus descended into so he could preach to the spirits of doomed and damned Nephilim. doesn't mean that either. We've talked about this before. Many dupe Protestants have allowed themselves to be deceived into believing that. We covered this issue extensively two years ago, and I believe we proved that point in two messages, one titled Spirits in Prison, another titled Abraham's Bosom, Prison, Purgatory, or Paradise. I'd recommend for anyone who is still duped on that point. I'm not going to go there today. As stated, that paradise, the Lord Jesus said, the malefactor would be rewarded with on that very day, means in the very presence of God. As Paul did say, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Paradise, the Lord Jesus said, that malefactor would be rewarded with, is the very same paradise that Paul is given a revelation of and wrote about in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Where it says in verse 1, It's not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such a one was caught up to the third heaven. I knew such a man, how that he was caught up into paradise. And heard unspeakable words, which, is, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one will I glory, yet in myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities. Paul actually was speaking of himself. We know from the verses later in that chapter. Uh, While well, Paul was once stoned left for dead outside the city of Lystra at one time in Acts chapter 14, many believe, and it may be sensible to conclude, that it was at this time Paul was given this revelation, this vision of paradise, so we read in Acts 14, verse 20, Howbeit, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. So he is still left for dead, and he jumped up and went back to work. <laughs> Pretty amazing. Paul said he was caught up to paradise, located in the third heaven. Paul said the third heaven. He didn't say uh, the second paradise, the third paradise. The point is there's only one paradise in the Bible. And it's the same one Jesus took the born-again malefactor who witnessed for him from a cross he hung on next to his saviors. There's only one paradise. It's the same paradise the Apostle John was given a word about to convey to the church at Ephesus. From the Lord in Revelation 2, verse 7, where he said, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh I will give to eat the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Paradise of God. Revelation 2.7. John then went on to describe that paradise as he saw it in Revelation 22. Verse 1 through 5 described it as follows. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb, and in the midst of the street of it, and on the other side of the river, on either side of the river, was there the tree of life. Again, Revelation 2.7 says, I will give to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So John is here describing that paradise. On either side of that river was there a tree of life, Revelation 22, verse 2, which bare twelve manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord giveth them that light, and they shall reign forever and ever. That malefactor that hung on that cross next to Jesus is in that very paradise. It was in that paradise that very day, Jesus said. There's only one paradise in the Bible, not two or three. And that paradise is the eternal home of the saints, where they shall see Jesus as he is, and they shall be like him, and they shall reign forever and ever. And the Lord Jesus promised a dying criminal who turned to him in the last hour of his life, turned to Jesus in faith, believing that he could save him from the hell he knew he deserved. On that very day that Jesus promised him that he would be absent from his body, he would be present with the Lord in that very same paradise. Two thieves hung on the cross that day. 
They were separated both physically and spiritually by the cross of Jesus that was interposed between them. To one thief, the cross was an offense, as we read in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. To unto us which are saved is the power of God. In verse 22 of 1 Corinthians 1, Paul says, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. So to one of these thieves, that cross was an offense. It was foolishness. But to the other, the cross was the power of God and the wisdom of God. Amen. The same sun that melts wax hardens clay, right? That's what we see here. One thief went with the Lord Jesus that same day into paradise, saved to the uttermost. But the other went to perdition, to everlasting destruction. One thief went to paradise, the other went to perdition. There's one more reference to the tree of life in Revelation 22. It says in verse 11, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. The point is, one thief went to paradise, the other went to hell. Perdition, destruction. Just as Jesus did with that rich young ruler, Lord Jesus let him go. Jesus let him go. He didn't beg the railer to repent. As Lord Jesus hung on that cross as the Lamb of God in infinite grace and mercy, bearing the sins of the entire human race for all time. At that same time, he was also the judge of the universe who judged the railer, the impenitent thief, unworthy of eternal life. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. The Lord Jesus is not going to drag you into heaven if you don't want to go. He'll let you walk. If you want to walk, you can walk. Verse 12, Revelation 22. Jesus said, And behold, I come quickly. My reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without, outside, are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers, murderers and idolaters, which means false religionists, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. All liars shall have their part in that lake that burns with fire and brimstone. Verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Whosoever will may come. That's what the Bible says. And Jesus said in John 6, 37, him that cometh unto me, I will no wise cast out. I'm almost done. While a deathbed or a last hour conversion is made possible by Christ's one-time sacrifice, it's still not advisable for two reasons. First, it'd be a shame to waste your life living for sin and shame and end up with no fruit to show on the day of judgment. Those who delay the day of their salvation drastically limit their fruitfulness for the Lord. Secondly, none of us know the hour that our death may come. That's right. And one of us could be killed in a car wreck on their way home from church today. We don't know. Any of us could die at any moment. Right? right. None of us have a promise of tomorrow. That's what we read in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 2. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And so, in closing, if there is one here today who may have been wearing a mask of Christianity to church, but knows in his heart he's not truly born again, then you need today to come to Christ and be saved to the uttermost. And if you'll do that, then when the roll is called up yonder, you'll be there with us, bright shining as the sun. Amen. In a moment we'll sing that hymn, 500, when the roll is called up yonder. Father in heaven, Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the cross. 
We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are able to save them to the uttermost that come to God by you. We thank you for what that means, that you're, you're going to make sure of our salvation, that you not only died for our sin, but that you ever live to make intercession for us. That you'll keep us saved by your power, not by ours. We thank you also, though, that being saved the uttermost also means the uttermost of sinners can come to you. We just thank you for your great salvation that could not be any invention of man. Only God could be the author of this salvation. We thank you so much. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Hymn 500, when the roll is called up yonder.